This meeting is being recorded. Well, good afternoon and welcome to week two of Black Voices Matter lecture series in recognition of Black History Month. This year's theme is belonging, finding a place of our own. While Black History Month is nationally recognized, Aberg recognizes that Black history occurs every day of the year. Today, today we have a fantastic guest and we cannot wait to introduce her to you. Please note that we will have a special session from 1 to 1.30 to have a Q&A with our speaker. However, don't forget to post your questions in the chat and our committee will keep their eyes out for it also. Don't forget to complete the evaluation at the end. We will make sure we share the link in the chat. I am Cheryl Isabel, a Bird Committee member and covering Wisconsin's Milwaukee Community Engagement Lead within the Extension's Health and Wellbeing Department. For years and of recent, we've been hearing a lot about African Americans being the first to accomplish major changes or additions to our society. And we always hear of those that are well known to us, but I wanna take some time to talk about one of the unsung sheroes that has been behind the scenes, but have made major contributions and have opened doors for many aspiring young African-American male and female medical students to have those same opportunities. Today, I'd like to highlight an unsung medical professional that is one of the first two excuse me, in her field. Did you know in black history that it was an African-American woman who was the first to become a neurosurgeon in the United States? In 1981, Dr. Alexa Canada was the first African-American woman in the United States to become a neurosurgeon. Alexa Irene Kennedy had almost dropped out of college as an undergraduate but after recovering her self-confidence, she went on to qualify as the first African-American woman neurosurgeon in the United States. Alexa Canada earned a BS degree in zoology from the University of Michigan in 1971 and graduated from the medical school there in 1975. In her work as a neurosurgeon, she saw young patients facing life-threatening illnesses, saw young patients, uh, with gunshot wounds, head trauma, hydrocephaly, and other brain injuries or diseases. Throughout her 20-year career in pediatric neurosurgery, Dr. Kennedy has helped thousands of patients, most of them aged 10 or younger. Her career began tentatively. She almost dropped out of college while in math mathematics major because, she says, I had a crisis of confidence. When she heard of a chance to win a minority scholarship in medicine, it was an instant connection. Her additional skills in writing and debate helped her earn a place in the University of Michigan Medical School, and she graduated cum laude in 1975. Such credentials still could not shield her from prejudice and dismissive comments. As a young black woman completing her surgical internship at Yale New Haven, New Haven Hospital in 1975, on her first day of residency, she was tending to her patients when one of the hospital's top administrators passed through the ward. As he went by, she heard him say, oh, you must be our new equal opportunity package. Just a few years later, while working as a neurosurgeon at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, from 1981 to 1982, her fellow physicians voted her one of the top residents. Dr. Kennedy was chief of neurosurgery at the Children's Hospital of Michigan from 1987 until her retirement in June of 2001. She holds two honorary degrees, a doctorate of humane letters from the University of Detroit Mercy, awarded in 1997, and a Doctor of Science degree from the University of Southern Connecticut, awarded in 1999. She received the Children's Hospital of Michigan's Teacher of the Year Award in 1984, 
and was inducted into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame in 1989. In 1983, she received the American Medical Women's Association President's Award, the Distinguished Service Award from Wayne State University Medical School. In 2002, the Detroit News named Dr. Kennedy Michiganer of the Year. And we just wanna take time to thank Dr. Kennedy for being a trailblazer, opening doors of possibilities for all young Black, African-American, male and female medical students. Please visit Aberg's SharePoint site and visit our calendar of events. Thank you for sharing your lunch hour with the African-American Black Employee Resource Group, Aberg. The ABERG's purpose is to serve as a resource and foster current and future African-American colleagues' success by sponsoring programming, providing collegial support, encouraging belonging, and raising a collective voice related to issues that impact employees' ability to thrive personally and professionally. We would love your feedback and will provide a link to the survey in the chat box as we close out this session. And now I wanted to acknowledge committee members, Danielle Hairston Green, the chair, Rick Mills, secretary, Eva Terry, treasurer, James Bowling and Catherine Bork-Smock, co-chair membership and retention committee, Carla Williams and Antifa Robinson, co-chairs the marketing and media committee, Interim Professional Development Shared Leadership Team, Ginny Abel, Aaron Conway, Monica Lobenstein, and Heather Quackenboss. I am super excited to introduce to you today, Alice Treor, Coordinator of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion for the Center for Teaching, Learning and Mentoring with UW-Madison. She will present today on Creating Healing Spaces, the benefits of affinity groups. Alice Treor has been an academic staff of the U UW system since 2000, first at UW Milwaukee and currently at UW Madison. She works at UW Center for Teaching, Learning and Mentoring as an equity, diversity and inclusion coordinator. Within the span of a career in higher education located in Wisconsin and elsewhere, she has worked in student affairs, academic affairs, and multicultural affairs. Participating in the following institute, institutes and trainings have significantly influenced her work, Social Justice Institute, the Midwest Academy, Organizing for Social Change, the Equity and Justice Institute, Embodied Social Justice Certificate and the Healing Center Education Primer. Alice earned a master's degree in creative writing from Illinois State University. Writing provided a platform for exploring race, gender, power, and privilege, assisting others in exploring their social cultural identities is a part of Alice's work that she finds invaluable. To review the full bio, please visit the Aberg SharePoint sites. Without further ado, I would love to introduce to you Alice Treor. Thank you for that, that wonderful and warm, informative and um, uh, inspiring intro, Cheryl, um, the, the intro of the piece of, of history, as well as making time to, to give folks a little bit of insight around my, my background as well. Um, bear with me for just one second as I attempt to share my screen. So I am hoping that you're all seeing uh, just my large title page at this time. Uh, again, I want to welcome you. I want to um, 
show my appreciation for you all deciding to share your lunch hour with this fabulous group of folks. I want to thank the team at UW Extension for inviting me and, and for creating space for all of us to come together and share thoughts and ideas around building um, inclusive spaces, helping us each thrive in the workplace. And um, I, I think these are especially uh, difficult times that impact Black communities in different ways. So I appreciate you uh, holding this space. Um, I am going to talk uh, quite a bit about healing spaces and for a minute in speaking about um, healing, I just want to take a few minutes to catch my breath, um, do a couple of deep breaths. I, I'm also going to take you through a, um, a grounding a little bit later, but uh, life happens. And even though it was a positive experience, I had a meeting this morning that that took a lot of energy. And so I want to claim that energy back so I can be here as present with you as possible. So before I get into the grounding, I want to give you an overview of what we'll cover today. I'm going to spend uh, just a little bit more time talking about who I am. I'm going to give you a definition of what healing centered engagement is and um, spend quite a bit of time offering how I utilize healing centered approach to learning communities and how you might be able to incorporate aspects of that in your uh, work as well. And then um, on the other side of my presentation, uh, we'll make some room for reflections, for questions, for you commenting on things that stood out for you, that resonated with you. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have some conversation for sure on the other side of this. During the course of the, our time, I'll be taking big gulps of water to make sure that that um, my voice st stays clear. I've been dealing with a little bit of um, congestion and so forth, uh, just a sign of the times and the weather that we're experiencing. So just for a, a minute, let's take some time to um, for all of us to settle into this space. You have come to share this hour from maybe some challenging meetings. Some of you had to move your bodies physically. Some of you are having to make some mental shifts. So one way of kind of pushing against systems that are always um, asking of us to show up, produce, and um, uh, be active, I wanna give us some space to breathe. I know I could use it. So I'm going to offer up um, a space for us to pause, to catch our breath, and to determine for yourself a rate of breathing that signals, signals to you a sense of calm. So take a few minutes to get uh, comfortable in your chair. You can kind of fill around, make sure you got your water nearby. You can close your eyes or you can keep them open whatever feels right for you. So today in this space, I invite you to pause for a moment so you can be as present as possible. Take a moment for your mind to catch up with your body so you can focus on what brought you here today. Take the time to gather your thoughts and acknowledge anything or everything that's impacting how you're showing up up today. Take those breaths in and then let them out to allow yourself some time to slow down. Today, just by showing up, you are advocating for yourself. You are here and breathing life into the names of those who are no longer with us. There are far too many names to say out loud right now, yet today we are showing up for them by showing up for ourselves. Slow down your racing minds and your thoughts if it's possible. 
let's give ourselves time to adjust and operate differently in a space that's designed not to diminish, not to disrespect or silence us. Breathe in empowerment, support, dignity, and care, and let that reside in you. Release your shoulders if you feel like they're reaching up towards your ears. Release your tongue if it's fixed to the roof of your mouth so you can allow your words to flow easily. Just by showing up today, you are advocating for yourself. Too often we are judged for showing up as ourselves, unfairly characterized as too loud, too angry, too sensitive, too demanding. So today I want you to make room for that person you have shut away. Today, make room for that person that you are reclaiming. We are all processing continuous acts of terrorism and violence, and we hold this in our bodies in different ways. So today, I hope you breathe in life into our time together and show up as present and whole as possible because there are so many of us who can't. One more deep breath in. Let it out. And I thank you for choosing your time to be with us. So if you were here last Wednesday, Siobhan Messiah um, set the course by giving us a brief and concise definition of what employee resource groups are. And I really appreciated it. Uh, so I wanna recap by just reminding us what ER with what ERGs are. Um, the participants in these groups are employees who share common salient identities. These are groups that exist to support and to help in personal and or career development. And they also manage to create safe spaces for marginalized populations. So one thing that drew me to saying yes to this group is I know that affinity groups, communities of practices, and ERGs differ in many ways. Um, affinity groups center work that's rooted in social justice. Communities of practice usually build themselves around a certain theme or a topic, while ERGs are seeking to build inclusive workplace environments. <clears throat> However, there are times when each of these groups can provide space for us for processing and unpacking, to pause and reflect together, to grieve together, and to breathe um, as, as we are in the midst of surviving difficult times. Um, Cheryl gave a, a great uh, introduction of what I'm bringing to the table today and for um, some work that I'm going to talk about a little bit further down the line, I wanted to share my journey here at UW-Madison. So who am I? And this is myself in terms of my, my work. I have been at UW-Madison for over 11 years. I've been in UW system for uh, 22 years now and time has flown. But just on this campus, I have had um, several different positions. I was the associate director of the Multicultural uh, Student Center. So I worked for the Division of Student Life. I was also in human resources as a trainer and curriculum developer. Um, I'm coming to my current position from the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Educational Achievement. And I'm currently helping to shape a newly developed role, which is the EDI coordinator for the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Mentoring. And for those of you who are on campus, probably going, oh, I've never heard of that. The center is fairly new, and I'm really excited 
about helping shape this particular um, uh, position. I'll come back to this slide a little bit later because I want to use it as um, something, as an example of something. I'm also going to talk a lot about um, Dr. Sean Jinwei or, or Jin Wright uh, during the course of our time together, and I'll talk a little bit more about him. But for now, I want to share his definition of healing, and um, and then we'll we'll move on to some of the things that I'm experiencing on campus. So Dr. Jen Wright describes healing as the following. Healing involves more than repairing the deep wounds of racism, healing the scars of sexism, or easing the pain of poverty. Healing is the capacity to restore our humanity and care for ourselves, as well as others, even in the midst of our fear. Healing is the only pathway to real justice because it requires that we take an honest look at what's harmed us and pushes us to restore our humanity. Take a second to look at that again. Uh, there are pieces of this that speak uh, to the work that I'm currently involved in. And in fact, Dr. Jen Wright is one of the reasons why I stopped approaching um, work, lifting up trauma, and started down a different path towards a healing-centered uh, approach. Um, Dr. Jen Wright himself had an epiphany while he was working with a group of young uh, Black men in a healing circle. He was discussing um, with this group of individuals who have who had survived a range of traumas in their young lives. So he was explaining to them the impact of stress and trauma on brain development and how trauma can influence our emotional health. And one young man, he was nodding yes to this. Uh-huh, yep, that resonates with me. Gotcha, yeah, I am carrying a lot of trauma. He said yes to all of this, but he also said, and I am more than what happened to me. I am not just my trauma. So that started, uh, it, that got me thinking about the work that I am doing with uh, Black staff and faculty on campus. Within race-based affinity groups, we make space for Black people to explore all of our social identities, not just race, but how those identities intersect. We make room for expressing the burden of racism, the damage that is done by internal racism, without having to bear the weight of explaining these challenges to those who live outside Black culture. We get to the heart of our stories without having to having them questioned or challenged, having to slow down to educate others. In our own spaces, it prevents us from having to put our pain on display, and it finally allows us to center ourselves. But in these spaces, I started thinking, where, where and when and how are we making space for healing and how are these conversations empowering us? Yes, we were identifying some of the things that are listed on this current um, slide that are signaling symptoms of harm. So we talked at length about imposter syndrome, illness, stress, the fatigue of racial battle fatigue, um, and going back to my previous slide, how frequently many of us had changed jobs on campus. We created space for naming and address, uh, addressing the impact of racism and microaggressions. We were bonding in our trauma, but how much time were we actually spending on healing and empowering each other? There is a quote, if any of you have been 
privileged um, to, to go to the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, there is um, a quote that comes from the, the book, Beloved, that's written by Toni Morrison. Uh, the quote on this slide is embedded in one of the walls, and it it's it's very powerful to me and so meaningful to me. Um, it's impossible for us to share our stories without bringing in certain aspects of our culture, our music, our art, our sp spirituality. It's all a part of our stories, and how all of this spans the reach of the reach that is as wide as the African diaspora. If any of you have read uh, the book Beloved, I'm, I'm going to ask you to recall the, the passage where the character uh, Baby Suggs is creating a healing center for enslaved people in a clearing. So she is standing on a rock and she is asking all of the people in her community to gather around her. And in this circle, she encourages self-love and encourages the community to take back all that's been stolen from them. She first invites the children who have never had the chance to be actual children in their state of being enslaved. She asks the children to come to the center of the circle and laugh. And the children laugh. They get to do something that they don't easily get to do. She asks the men to come to the circle and dance. And then she asks the women to come to the circle and cry. Each one of the things that she's asking are things that these individuals don't get to show. As enslaved human beings, we didn't get to dance. We didn't get to express joy. We didn't even get to express sorrow. Um, in her fantastic way of writing, Toni Morrison um, evokes this, this image of individuals who are now laughing and crying and dancing and laughing and what have you. And it's, it's such a, a beautiful uh, passage. But baby, baby Suggs encourages the circle to love the parts of themselves that they were taught to hate. Um, and again, this passage is on the wall at the memorial, um, memorial for, for peace and justice. Even today, we are still needing these types of spaces to process what we've lost the lies we've been told about each other and ourselves, and we need spaces to, um, to gather and, and celebrate the truth and the love that we need to reclaim. So my introduction to a healing-centered education came at the beginning of the pandemic in 22 or 2022 when the world shut down um there was a time when a lot of offices were pausing they were scrambling around trying to figure out how do we take our our work online um how do we how do we um, move from in-person to virtual? And a lot of you are probably still scarred by some of those conversations um, and are still managing those conversations as well. But there was such a rush to regain a semblance of, of normalcy, what we were used to, but it, we were missing the point that there was a time to recreate, rethink, and reimagine. I actually was encouraged by my supervisor at that time to take that space to reimagine our work. So I took some time as well as doing my work. I didn't get to stop completely. We figured out how to move it online, but I also took some time to invest in my own self-care. And this came by way of me educating myself and taking the time to explore new approaches to my work. When we slowed down 
that was the time when I really got to invest some time and energy in thinking about are these conversations that I'm inviting people to a circle to have, are they helping or are they causing more pain? My work started feeling extremely heavy as I was mucking through how to how to take it to virtual. Um, there was a rush for anyone who was doing EDI work to start educating the masses. It didn't matter what kind of emotional pains you were carrying yourself, just go into go mode. Um, I found myself as a Black person who was reeling with the differential impact that COVID was having on Black and Brown bodies. I was having to create spaces that were going to educate my white colleagues around the impacts of racism. It was a heavy time, and I know some of us are still trying to heal from that. As a facilitator, I wanted to do something different in BIPOC and Black spaces. Um, when George Floyd was murdered in um, on May 25th, 2020, I thought that there was going to be a big shift, a big lasting shift in the way that we did this work. Um, but as we can see where we are today, arguing about uh, critical race theory um, and a whole bunch of other shenanigans, nothing changed. And it might have even gotten worse. So a part of my self-education was to take some online courses from other practitioners, other social justice practitioners, and I found a group of Black and BIPOC facilitators who were doing amazing things. One thing that I noticed right off the bat, that when I was in those spaces, I didn't feel heavy. My heart was light. These people were talking about the same things that I was discussing, things like um, uh, white supremacy culture and other systems of oppression. They were talking about this rush to normalcy. They were talking about um, the impact of COVID, but they were also balancing it out by creating spaces where we could express joy. So I witnessed the same type of work being done in a loving, caring, and healing way. I and I and the thing that each one of these individuals did was they centered liberation and they talked about what is possible. They created spaces for us to reimagine and really work towards the, the communities that we wanted to exist in. So when I was leaving these centers um, or these online classes, again, lighthearted and feeling good. Um, I also noticed the gifts that they had given me. These were folks that were not about um, power hoarding or information hoarding. They were about lifting up and supporting their communities. So they would share uh, slides, handouts. They were like, take it, use it. Let's, let's, let's heal ourselves. Um, I also noticed that a lot of them incorporated playlists, so there was tons of music in the mix. We shared book titles. We talked about podcasts that keep us up and lifted during the course of the day. And some of us were even engaged in digital art making during these courses. So we centered play and we uplifted um, creativity and we built spaces for dreaming. Um, these, work, these spaces worked in total opposition to the, the way that dominant culture um, encourages us, us to work. Um, and they were joyful. So, some of them are, are offering courses right now. A lot of them utilize mindfulness um, in their practices, in their work for social justice and equity, and really seamlessly bind these things um, effortlessly. And again, with joy. 
So in leaving these courses, the thing that stuck with me is that I am so much more than my pain. What attracted me to this, and these are the next few slides, are some of the elements that make up a healing-centered movement. So a healing-centered movement is one that moves us from thinking about what happened to you and moves us to what's right with you. It moves us from um, being victims of traumatic events to agents of change in creating our own well being. It centers uh, community. It reminds us that we are all interdependent. It knocks down the myth of the individual and makes sure that we start thinking of ourselves collectively. And so we can readily and easily build communities of care. And lastly, it is not just a feel good movement. We are definitely discussing oppressive systems. Um, so there is that political edge to it because we've got to get through the rough stuff in order for us to get to joy and accomplish the change that needs to be made. The rest of my presentation, I'm going to walk you through some slides because um, this is one way of achieving healing spaces. One of the things that I um, really want to lift up and spotlight is dominant culture will have us believing that there is one way to achieve something. So you will hear me use language like, I'm going to offer up. I will not give you a handout that has one, two, three, this is how you achieve it. Because I don't know the conditions of your situation, what you are needing to liberate yourself from and what you're healing from. So um, we are building spaces where people can explore that. Healing is a journey, just like social justice is a journey, just like getting, just like any kind of self-work is a journey. And so what I'm going to talk about is proposing, suggesting, and then having individuals build what's right for them. I've been uh, co-facilitating with five other people um, in a program that's called the Racial Justice Healing Collective here on campus. And um, we utilize a book by Dr. Annalise Singh, um, who has come up with a pathway to healing. She has five steps, I'm, I'm sorry, 10 steps to healing that she is suggesting and again, I, the, the, the book is designed with um, very thoughtfully making sure that individuals know that there's not one way to get at things. But before we jump up and, and try to heal ourselves, what Dr. Singh is suggesting is there are there's information that we need to go back and get before we can move for, forward. And so it's kind of like taking a Sankofa journey, going back and getting the history that we weren't taught, that we were denied, um, excavating all of the lies that we've been told, not only about other people, but about ourselves. So learning history, our own cultural histories and our own personal histories all over again. So there's um, simultaneously learning and unlearning going on. Um, I am going to try to not overwhelm you with information. This book is um, something that we use as a guide. Um, it is divided into 10 chapters that work as kind of like journal writing. So individuals aren't reading a chapter and just regurgitating what they've taken in, but they're getting a chance to um, think about how they've experienced racism, think about their own socialization, think about their own history, 
um, cultural history, and think about the impact of white supremacy culture on them. Again, we do make space for other people, other social identities to come into the mix. There is no way we could only focus on race during these conversations. So our, our religious backgrounds, our sexual orientations, our class status, our level of education, our lived experiences, all swirl around in the mix in these conversations. So just taking a look, I again, um, if I could just breeze you the, through the book, this is um, the best way to do it. Again, these are proposed ways of um, getting to the heart of what individuals need to heal from. Um, we aren't prescribing it. This is your own personal journey, but the chapters help contain that work at least in a box that you can wrap your heads around um, this type of conversation. We, a lot of us never get a chance to just sit with our own social identities, especially our racial identities. We never get to sit with and discover how we are received and perceived by the world. We don't get a chance to have conversation around internalized racism. When we sit with folks that share our social identities, it's not all roses and butterflies because there's a lot that we've internalized, myself has have internalized about other black people. So this is a space to, to work through that type of conversation as well. There are history pieces. Um, there is um, a recommendation for mapping out grief. A lot of us may have experienced the news um, of um, Tyree Nichols in a different way, but because you were in the act of producing and working, um, you might not have realized that you were in the process of grieving. Um, so yeah, so this, this is the second part of the journey as well. So catching yourself in the flow of racism, understanding racism in your relationships, in the workplace, with your partners, with your fa family members. Um, these are conversations we don't get to have readily. Closer to the end of the book, uh, Dr. Singh is showing us ways that we can reclaim our whole racial selves, how we can become allies, and how we can collectively begin the healing. So this is the way that our um, group um, navigates the conversation of healing. What we've added to Dr. Singh's book is the encouragement of journaling. So after each one of our sessions, when we are interacting with each other, when we're talking about specific topics and so forth, um, we want to give people the space to, once they've left the group, to actually start um, to sit with what's occurred, uh, to take a look at the stories that they shared, um, what triggered them during that session. And I, I've got that listed on this slide. So we provide our participants with journals and we provide them every week uh, after we meet, we encourage them to do some journaling and use these particular guiding questions. So what did I learn about myself today? How can this information contribute to my healing? We ask them to think about the content of the conversation that we had, um, think about the stories that they shared or didn't share, think about how they showed up. What else were they holding that particular day? Um, how did that impact how engaged or not engaged they were that day? How did I interact with other people? Did I notice some of my triggers? Did I have some epiphanies during that time? Um, what do I need to take note of that I need to spend more time? Because that might signal some things that I need um, healing from. 
And again, there's a whole section that we're encouraging people to just sit with how might this information signal what, what inside of me still needs some healing. Um, and we hope that by the end of this journey, you're, you're, we don't, we, we're, we're not proposing that after this sex, uh, session with us, you're going to be completely healed, but at least you're mapping out a plan for healing. So how can I identify practices that can assist with healing that relates to today's conversation or topic? What do I need more of? What do I want for myself? And what will it take to get it? There are so many times that we are experiencing something and um, it feels good. You know, you, you know, your body knows the difference between being in a situation where people are operating on a gotcha, you know, playing that gotcha game versus you're in a space where people are treating you or or developing an environment that says, I got you. So the difference between gotcha and I got you. And those are the, the types of things that we're wanting people to really cue into what's happening in the space that my my breathing is calm. I'm not going through gymnastics to say things. Um, I can speak with, with confidence. I'm not afraid of backlash and things like that. So how do you um, keep note of those? And, and that's why we encourage a lot of journaling. So steps towards a healing-centered approach. Um, there are a couple of things, so we're not prescribing how to do it, but what is in the mix could be very useful to all of you. So having conversations about co-creating a space, what would your space look like? Um, discussing shared language, coming up with group agreements, and again, um, pushing against dominant culture, wanting um, group agreements that are more created to to ensure people's level of comfort or to make sure that conflict doesn't occur and things like that. But these are group agreements that enable us to practice asking for what we want. Um, let's see, also a push against um, uh, dominant culture performance is building in space for reflection. So posing questions, but having people sit and think about um, their responses before we're asking them to immediately respond. In some cases, we're asking people not even to say things out loud, but just to write it. It's your own work. And so not necessarily does everything need to be spoken out loud. Um, open up conversation around some of the concepts such as trust, confidentiality, respect, and vulnerability, because a lot of these things mean different things to individuals. And when you have conversa conversations around what's important to you and what it means to you, that opens up um, space for deeper conversations. And, and again, it is getting us to slow down and really care for the communities that we're trying to build. Uh, one thing that you wanna keep noting to individuals that healing is a process that we navigate for a lifetime. So again, um, these spaces give us a chance even if we share the same race um, and some similar social identities, when we get together, we get to take some time to talk about and discuss what makes us us. So what usually comes in the mix are either our, either our um, family histories or our cultural histories. We get to dive deep into how we were socialized. We get to talk to talk about our lived experiences. So there are very few spaces 
um, to discuss the varied and unique Black experiences. Because of our personal histories and our socializations and our unique lived experiences, we can show up Black in a multiple, uh, a multiple of ways, a multitude of ways. Um, no space is built for liberation no, no space built for liberation can exist without acknowledging the damage done by white supremacy culture and any other dominant culture. Um, in healing, we have to face the damage of internalized racism. So again, when we get into these spaces, there's still a lot of rewiring that we need to do amongst ourselves. There are so many stories that we've been told about ourselves that we have to deconstruct and dismantle. So even in our affinity groups, we have to have some difficult conversations. Um, we have to talk about those things that seek to divide and conquer us. Uh, things like proximity to whiteness, colorism, social class, uh, respectability, uh, politics, all those types of things, and the impact of anti-Black racism. Within our own culture, there's so much to unpack. So how do we unpack it? We unpack it through story sharing. Um, in our circles, we are sharing lived experiences as a means of excavating, excavating self. Um, we're tracking and we're exploring what we each uniquely need to heal from. So this is not saying that our healing journey is going to be different, but we're giving space for people to explore their own personal healing. Um, uh, journey, what that will look like. So a lot of shared experiences could come from something like the book that I suggested. It could be a shared experience uh, at, at one point during the semester. Our particular group went through an exhibit that stood on campus. It was called uh, the Public History Project, and it gave a chance for individuals to explore um, all types of systems of oppression that have occurred on our campus throughout history. Um, there are films that you can experience together. You can read a book together. But what can, what can you utilize that can be the foundation of these conversations? Sometimes they're hard to get started. They um, call for a lot of vulnerability and trust. Sometimes it's just a series of guiding questions that a group can throw out. I created one for us. If we were in a group, something that might um, get us to open up and start st story sharing is a question um, such as this one. What important aspects of yourself don't come to work with you. Why not? What about your workplace environment would need to change for you to bring that part of self to work? You would be amazed at the volume, the depth, the level of um, stories that would come out of people just responding to a question like that. So, um, Think about, uh, definitely think about shared language, what language is important to your organization or your particular group. Our group spends a lot of time discussing group agreements. We, we refer to white supremacy culture quite a bit. We also use a term that's called tracking, which is essential to journey, uh, to, to journal, journaling and tracking your healing journey. But um, different groups, there might be some other terms that are important. Shared language is really important. Traditionally, there are BIPOC communities that were um, either told not to speak their own cultural language or were kept from information, weren't allowed to read. And so um, pushing against dominant culture, we're gonna make sure that no one hoards power by having more information than another person. 
co-creating um so group agreements again it's not to to keep people in line group agreements aren't but what they function as is a means of co-creating a space that feels liberating that encourages community building that allows space for participants to reclaim their authentic selves i have a list up of examples of group agreements I definitely want to spend some time talking to all of you. So I'm gonna kind of kind of move a little faster as we're coming up on that uh, one o'clock hour. But these are some examples of group agreements. Some of them come from black emotional and mental health collective. So the ones that have beam in parentheses, that's actually an organization. We've adapted them for our use. And some of them come from the Social Justice Training Institute. And a number of them are just because our, um, our group created them and wanted those in the mix. Some things that I wanna point out to you is a practice that could be built into group agreements is honoring your boundaries uh, your boundaries as well as others. Some of us have a really hard time in our workplaces keeping our peace and um, helping people break um, bad habits that they've they've identified as bad habits and they they want to replace with healthier ways of responding and being. So this is also a space to help each other hold boundaries identify boundaries and, and keep them, but there's a list of other things as well. I've mentioned white supremacy culture. Um, Tima Akun is a uh, social justice warrior, I'll call her, that has actually come up with characteristics of white supremacy culture that show up in the workplace. Um, and these are some of the things that you can hold in front of you. Um, things that you might want to find gentle ways to push back on. How can you liberate yourself within the workplace by not upholding some of these characteristics? And just going through tracking, you'll hear us talk about tracking and listening to your body quite a bit in these spaces. Mindfulness is uh, uh, it, uh, tracking is a piece of mindfulness. It's just saying, pay attention to yourself, um, pay attention to different situations that um, allow you to gather uh, information about what triggers you, when you feel your heart rate go up, your voice changes or gets tight, you're having a hard time creating um speaking clearly, that's signaling things to you. So think about tracking what and who triggers you and why, how much you talk or don't share in a group or when you're talking too much. Um, think about the things that are working for you and what you want to see more of. We spend a lot of time discussing what we hope to um, uh, establish and create in a space. And um, that's a good conversation, like in reimagining a community that you could be, what would you want that, that space to look like? When we are talking, when we open um, the, the floor for conversation, I'll pull this main ingredient slide up again for you. But I want to end with this slide, just a glimpse at Black Joy. All that I've discussed today, I'm offering up the pursuit of Black Joy in the form of healing spaces. A healing-centered approach allows us to acknowledge systems of oppression as we co-create a healthy state of being for ourselves. We're building muscle for reclaiming ourselves and asking for what we want, even if it's just for 90 minutes twice a month. I'm going to close with a passage from um, a poem written by a poet scholar. His name is uh, Jaya John, and this is a passage from a poem entitled Fragrance After Rain. 
She wasn't only tired, she was uninspired. She traced back, back the path she had taken since birth and realized it was a path laid down by others. She left the path, stepped where there were no footsteps, learned to make choices that pleased her soul. She felt something new and wonderful grow in her chest. She came to call this feeling peace. A few acknowledgments of some individuals who have helped me on this path. I want to give a special shout out to the person, um, Frida Zuckerberg, who is actually a colleague of mine. I could not do this work without her. Um, we have had the opportunity to co-facilitate for a number of years, and she has become um, uh, a sister to me, actually. Um, I have a circle of support. Frida is somebody that I, I text every day, I talk to every day. She is somebody who encourage me, encourages me that I got this, that I can do this. She helps me unpack and process things. I can't say enough about having a strong circle of support. And that's all I have for you. I am going to Stop sharing so I can see your lovely faces. Thank you, Alice, for spending this amazing hour with us. And I just want to thank you for this very empowering presentation, um, creating a space for just breathing, you know, and um, all of those strategy points of strategies that we could, we should take into, uh, put in our toolkits to help us be mindful of utilizing mindfulness mm -hmm. and um, self care throughout, you know, our work and our relationships and the different things and challenges that we face on a daily basis. So thank you so much for that empowering presentation. And on behalf of the Aberg and our colleagues, friends, and partners of the Division of Extension, we hope you can we can call upon you to continue to engage us in meaningful dialogue. Um, so um, we don't we're going to open this time for any Q and A, and I don't see anything. in the chat box at this time. I think, but oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Cheryl. I think we're mm -hmm. a small enough group that folks could also unmute and um, speak your question if you want to do it that way. Yes, thank you. And I see that uh, there is a question uh, from Kate Walner. Hello, and thanks again for not only being able to have this and getting all the logistics in order, but also for speaking. So thanks to everyone who made that possible. Um, I work with the youth in 4-H uh, and youth development, and I'm in the Northland of Wisconsin. So uh, I, and I've just started this position. So I'm trying to figure out ways of not just my role supporting the youth, but also our community really facilitating space for the youth. And the, the, concepts and the dialogues uh, and the tools that you've suggested are awesome. And I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to go about effectively having these conversations with different generations, um, just because they are going to have a lot of different feelings about that, if that makes sense, different buy-in too. Definitely. And, um, and thank you for asking because, yeah, I, I think, um, Kate, what you just shared, um, is a reminder that that if we keep approaching work as a what one size fits all, we're going to do some damage. Um, that's that's where we go wrong, thinking that we we can get the box of cereal and pour it in and stir. Right. Um, I I think it would be helpful for your group to sit and think about some of the some of the 
how how do you get youth to open up and talk about their their lived experiences so um right away i'm i'm thinking you know consider the the physical setup of the room, um, having people sit in a circle, um, having someone in a role of facilitator, uh, role model first, go first. And so it, it does some level setting for the, the depth and, and so forth, but definitely um, setting up some, some group agreements and the group agreements will help share that that community of care. And maybe that's one of your first conversations, Kate, is what do we want to build together? Um, how, how do you feel safe? How do you feel heard? Share a story when you felt heard and empowered and 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 your your concerns were centered, those types of things. Um off to the side of me, I, I also <laughs> wanted to, to share some, some just things that encourage play. Um, one of my coworkers had these high cubes um, that have words on them. So you're inviting, you could invite folks to just create some, some sentences and words. So you're incorporating play. Um, there's an individual on uh, campus with the wheelhouse, one of our sessions in the Racial Justice Healing Collective, she is going to tailor an art project that, that um, layers onto our next conversation. So we're gonna be making art while, while we talk. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. And if you ever also have like co-facilitators that you've worked with or have any suggestions on that, because maybe that will help too with getting different folks to the table, depending on. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Feel free to um, just jump on. We're a small group now, so we have and we do have time for that. Else. I've got a question. So I really liked and appreciated what you were saying about uh, replacing a focus on trauma with one of healing and replacing a focus uh, on pain with, um, with one of joy. And it reminded me um, a few years ago, I heard Winona LaDuke, who's an Indigenous activist, say that she focuses 80% of her time on building what she wants to see in the world, 10% of her time on learning, and just 10% on fighting against the status quo. And I, I just, I thought that was a really interesting framing of, of act, because it, it feels like a lot of activism work is 100% is focused on the fight, right? So I just wanted to hear your perspective on how that maybe ties in with, with what you've been talking about. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, uh, the, again, I, I think that, um, I, I think that one thing that I took away from the spaces that introduced me to the healing centered approach, um, definitely, definitely, uh, the the fight was in the mix, but the fight became um, how are you going to get the, once we have reimagined um, a space that we would love to see for ourselves? How do you get there, right? And so that conversation entailed talking about systems that that work hard against us creating those those places of peace of obtaining that joy and that liberation so i never i i don't want to um i'm glad you're giving me this opportunity it's like we sit and we dream but then we got to figure out how to go get it right and um so it's and and i i i um I would encourage the, the, the language to be just that, 
So how do you get it? You, you've articulated what you want, what's standing in the way. And then we know the things that we need that, that are challenging our, um, our joy and liberation. And then we can have conversations around um, the dismantling. That, that conversation also looks different for individuals that are just trying to stay healthy and whole in the workplace, right? Because sometimes like going for the big systems fight, that's the very thing that's burning us out. Sometimes I'm like, how do I get to Wednesday? <laughs> so one thing that I did want to talk about is cultivating peace in your own space. I was going to go to campus and and have this conversation in um, an office that I needed to borrow because I'm in a cubicle. So I needed some privacy and I decided I'm setting up here. I am in my little makeshift artist studio. On the back of my wall are some of my ancestors and my 100 year old grandmother who turned 100 uh, last month. I. I curated some joy, but I, I, I would not prescribe the, the way that I've done it as the way because I don't know who gets the choice to work remote. Um, uh, so so what, what do you do with what you've got? Thank you so much, Alice. Um, this has just been phenomenal. I am just in awe of just, this whole series that you've presented to us this afternoon. And I just want to just take us away and close us out with just a few pearls that I received from, um, from your lecture this afternoon. And something just for, that I'm gonna think about and I hope those of us that are left in, in this group and that will view this uh, presentation um, in the future is Pearl number one, allow yourself space to breathe and experience empowerment, support, dignity, and care. And healing is a journey. Build what's right for you. And also, I'm a journaler. So just encouraging that journaling to um, help you release and just um, reevaluate some of the things that you are thinking about uh, situations, um, how you want to be a stronger support in your community and the people in your lives, you know, just your family members. And acknowledging that healing is a process we navigate for a lifetime. That was so powerful for me, you know. Um, and then lastly, number five, invest in self-care, you know. Um, look for healing education. You know, we, we are more than our pain. And thank you so much for the quote uh, from Dr. Sean Ginwright. And I took away this one. Healing is the only pathway to real justice because it requires that we take an honest look at what harmed us and pushes us to restore our humanity. Thank you again for that. Um, and as a reminder, um, you can find Alice Traor's full bio and recording of today's session can be found only on our SharePoint site. We hope that you have enjoyed yourself and will return for our Black History Voices Matter series, which will end on February 22nd. Uh, look for a Zoom registration soon. Thank you to everyone who joined this live discussion today and those who will be watching the recording. Thank you for taking the time to watch this phenomenal discussion. For those of you who will stay logged on to have a more intimate Q&A with Alice, hold on tight. Otherwise, have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you soon. And uh, one other thing, uh, please join us next week for part three of our lecture series on February the 15th, uh, we will be uh, welcoming Dr. Stacy Sowell and her message to us is going to be the help meet and the head. 
So I'm really looking forward to that. And again, thank you again, Alice. We enjoyed you. We welcome you back for more conversation and dialogue in the future. And for everyone, have a wonderful rest of your day.